The pool system that emerged in Panama and in the 1991 Iraq war became the broad template for the Pentagon's media relations throughout the 1990s. But during the US war in Afghanistan, following the terrorist attacks on 9-11, this model was modified due to the nature of the conflict. Operation Enduring Freedom, as the US intervention in Afghanistan was called, was an unconventional war waged against an unorthodox enemy in the form of Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. The vast bulk of US and British operations focused on a massive air campaign. The US footprint was heavily de-emphasized, with only a handful of special forces and CIA operatives inserted on the ground, whose main task was to coordinate the movements of local indigenous allies in the form of the Northern Alliance. To give you a sense of the light footprint of US forces on the ground, after two months of fighting and after the fall of the Taliban regime, there were only 230 US forces on the ground in Afghanistan. Add to this the difficult terrain in Afghanistan, a war of this kind, fought by clandestine operatives and from high altitude, didn't lend itself to up-close media coverage. The idea that journalists might temporarily join military units, as pool reporters had done during the Gulf War, was initially rejected by decision makers. To allow reporters to embed with special forces was to risk diluting their specialness to the point of operational nullity. As a result, Susan Carruthers argues, the Pentagon implemented a media system that was similar to the one in Grenada in 1983. That was a war in which, in terms of, of the Pentagon's response to managing the media, the pendulum had swung more or less back to where it was in Grenada. The initial stages of the war in Afghanistan were marked by an extreme reluctance to allow the media anywhere very near the site of where military operations were actually underway. And that was also aided by the kind of war that it was. If you think of the very first phase of the war in Afghanistan, that was a war that was largely being conducted by aerial bombardment and by special operations. The fact that special operations constituted the bulk of the ground forces in Afghanistan, of course, gave the military a wonderful opportunity to say to the press, well, of course you can't be allowed to embed with the military when that would jeopardize operational security. What are the point of having special forces if journalists are reporting on the very essence of their specialness? This cannot be done. So there were operational reasons to keep journalists as far from the theater of operations as possible. And these operational reasons became a convenient excuse for decision makers to keep the press corps out of Afghanistan. The lack of protest against this decision was helped by a hyper-nationalist atmosphere in the United States post 9-11. The terms of engagement were fundamentally changed by 9-11, and I think we absolutely have to bear in mind that controlling the press is never simply a matter of what can physically be done to constrain the logistical, technological environment in which journalists operate. It's always also about the political and ideological circumstances in which war reporting unfolds. So for the Pentagon, that was, of course, a tremendous advantage that the climate of extreme hyperpatriotism, of intense vigilance that was being exercised both from above by the state and below from a patriotically mobilized citizenry was such that journalists were acutely self-aware about what kinds of reportage were acceptable or unacceptable in reporting the war in Afghanistan. Therefore, the outburst of extreme nationalism and the unconventional nature of US operations allowed the Pentagon to largely keep the press out of the early stages of the war in Afghanistan. There were, however, some exceptions. A few journalists, so-called unilaterals, made it into the country. But this was extremely difficult, costly and dangerous. 
The terrain was oftentimes inaccessible, there was a lack of technological infrastructure, and Western journalists tended to lack linguistic, let alone cultural, awareness. All this made it horrendously expensive. These unilaterals had to hire security guards who oftentimes charged around 2,000 US dollars per day. The average cost for a hotel room was 200 US dollars per day. Having to carry with them that much money was, of course, risky. Local Afghans dubbed them walking ATMs, who were regularly robbed, kidnapped, and killed. For war reporters to venture into Afghanistan, therefore, was prohibitively expensive and dangerous. By the end of 2001, more journalists had died in Afghanistan than US forces. Some reporters embedded with forces of the Northern Alliance. But this was a war without a clear front line, and not much military action was involving those allied Afghan forces on the ground. As a result, the footage these reporters produced predominantly showed bombs raining down on distant mountain ranges. And to get at least some action footage, reporters oftentimes paid Northern Alliance fighters to fire their weapons as if they were engaging their enemies. With the press excluded, and with the few unilateral reporters unable to get anywhere close to the action, Western media outlets were forced to rely on the information and on the prepackaged film footage provided by the American and British military. This had two implications. First, reporters were reduced to mere stenographers of the military PR apparatus. And second, the coverage Western audience got to see was largely what the military wanted them to see. The only international media within Afghanistan throughout the conflict was Al Jazeera. And the coverage Al Jazeera produced caused some consternation. It regularly showed dead civilian bodies. It continued to air video statements by Osama bin Laden. And it was seen by US and British militaries as the propaganda mouthpiece of Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. The Western press corps only arrived in Kabul after the fall of the Taliban regime in late 2001. And after focusing on the failed hunt for bin Laden in the mountains of Tora Bora, it quickly disappeared from Afghanistan altogether. Operation Enduring Freedom had come to an end at least for most of 2002 and 2003, before Al-Qaeda and the Taliban started returning and the fighting resumed. By 2002, though, Afghanistan had become the forgotten war, and the media's attention had shifted further west, gearing up for the war in Iraq in 2003. We can see the extent to which Western, and in particular US media, lost interest in Afghanistan when looking at the following figures. In January 2002, US network news together aired a total of 106 minutes on Afghanistan. One year later, in January 2003, the comparable figure had dropped down to 11 minutes. In March 2003, it was a scant 60 seconds. By 2005, only Newsweek and the Washington Post had a full-time reporter in Kabul, and the nightly news broadcast for the entire year of 2005 amounted to 147 minutes. Afghanistan no longer was the news. It was too costly, too dangerous, and by 2002, attention had decisively shifted towards Iraq.